to confirm con. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change or E4C for short. Today, we're quite pleased to bring you this virtual salon with our colleagues from the IEEE Africa Council. Um, virtual salons allow us to deep dive into critical topics and technology for good in conversations with key actors. So as we're all keenly aware, COVID-19 has highlighted the universal need for equitable connectivity, particularly the challenges faced on the African continent. In today's salon, we will explore the demands and broadband connectivity, including challenges and opportunities in light of the ongoing pandemic. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'm the director of the Engineering Global Development Team at the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and also um, president of Engineering for Change. I will be one of your moderators for today's salon, along with uh, my colleague, Ronald Asumba. And we are joined by an incredible panel and some special guests, including Mr. Alex Wong, Chief of Special Initiatives at ITU, Josephine Melitza, African Regional Coordinator for Association of Progressive Communications, El Connect Project, Juanita Clark, Founder and CEO of Digital Council Africa, and Dr. Bella Musa, Director of Innovations and Industry Relations at Huawei Technologies. Our special guests include Vincent Kabunga, who you'll hear from shortly, and Mr. Porva Kajkoya, Kotia, apologies for that, uh, who you will also be hearing from shortly. The salon will be recorded and archived on E4C site and YouTube channels. Both of those URLs are listed on the slide. Information on upcoming webinars and seminars offered by Engineering for Change are going to be listed on the site. And E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming events directly. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact our team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by vulnerable populations. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, last mile connectivity, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become an E4C member. Membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, a prior art database of over a thousand essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. Members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interests. You can learn about our impact and uh, learn how to become a member on the link listed on this slide. E4C's research work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver our ecosystem EU of technology for good. Original research is conducted by E4C research fellows annually on behalf of our partners, who include multilateral organizations, social enterprises, nonprofits, and private sector representatives globally. Findings are delivered as digestible reports with implementable insights to advance the sustainability objectives of our partners, and of course, the sector at large. So we invite you to visit our research page, uh, the URL is listed on, on the slide, um, to explore our research collaborations and review the state of engineering global development, a compilation of academic programs and institutions offering training in the sector. If you have research questions or want to work with us on a research project as a fellow, please do look at those URLs that are listed and contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org. And we are opening up our applications for the 2022 cohort um, in the coming months. So I encourage you to stay abreast of all announcements. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to a few upcoming events uh, that may be of interest to you. This includes our upcoming E4C webinar on November 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern, which is going to focus on technologies for social inclusion, particularly on water and energy in Argentina and broadly in Latin America. Uh, this is a webinar that's going to be in Spanish and include a really unique, uh, also compilation of um, panelists. 
and you'll be able to learn about impact projects that have been developed during the last year by the National Institute of Industrial Technology of Argentina and from the E4C and ASME community on the subjects of access to water and rational use of, the ener of energy in Latin America. So really are welcome all uh, to join us for that. And also don't forget our upcoming annual event, Impact Engineered. You're invited to join us for illuminating speeches, interactive experiences, a special launch and a celebration of innovation on December 2nd of this year. That event will be from 10 a.m. through 1 p.m. Eastern Standard. It will be entirely free and you can learn more details at impact-engineered.org. Now, with all of that background, we'd like to take a moment to meet some of our audience members. So I'll please use the chat window that is located on your screen to tell us where you are located. I'll get us started. Um, so, all right, there we go. Um, if the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. So we have uh, folks joining us from Nairobi and I'm um, in Brooklyn. So do enter your locations. Uh, we have uh, New York, of course, represented. Uh, just remember to use the chat window to type any comments, concerns, or issues for our presenters. And um, then use the Q&A box to type in uh, your questions uh, that we can aggregate for the presenters during the Q&A portion of this event. So welcome from Malawi to Florida to Princeton, New Jersey. We are very pleased to have you here with us today. All right, with that, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Vincent Kabunga to join us. Apologies, accidental press of the slides here. Tell us a little bit more about our colleagues and the programs available through the IEEE Africa Council who have made this virtual salon possible. Over to you, Vincent. Uh, thank you very much, Ayana. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, join uh, today's uh, event. Uh, we're really excited that uh, we've been able to partner with the E4C to make today's uh, uh, webinar possible. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, IEEE is the world's largest professional association advancing technology for humanity. Uh, we publish standards, uh, technical journals, sponsor conferences, and develop uh, all kinds of opportunities to serve the professional interests of our members. Um, my name's uh, Vincent Kabunga, and I happen to, I am serving as the chair of the IEEE Africa Council, uh, which is one of the partners uh, for today's event. And uh, we're really excited that you've been able to uh, join us today for this activity. Uh, the Africa Council is an entity within the IEEE organization, uh, which was set up to enable our people on the ground in IEEE sections and subsections to collaborate and uh, uh, to collaborate across the region to achieve a lot more than they would on their own, on their own in their individual locations. Uh, we also represent uh, our members within Africa uh, to our stakeholders and within IEEE itself enabling us to have people on the ground that help us to do the good work that IEEE would like to see done in our communities. We also provide a mechanism for IEEE to engage with the government, local government officials, administrations, authorities, regulators, and other folks that are working on the ground to work in, in, in Africa and support the development of public of a suitable public policy that will be uh, uh, able to advance the engineering profession on the ground. And uh, as I said, uh, this is uh, today's, being a part of today's event is a great uh, part of what we do. And uh, as you can see here, we're doing a lot to support our members in Africa. We are working to make it possible for our, more of our members to publish uh, we are providing uh, opportunities for our young people to get involved in regional events that uh, enable them to develop uh, solutions that we feel will be able to advance uh, the communities in their locations. And also bringing technical experts uh, from across the globe 
closer to the folks on the ground so that we can have that knowledge transfer that will be really key for driving uh, the transformation that we've been talking about for very long. Thank you very much. And I hope you'll enjoy today's uh, event. Back to you, Ayana. Thank you so much, Vincent, for that introduction. And thank you for partnering with us on this event. Um, next up, uh, I would like to introduce uh, today's moderator, uh, Mr. Ronald Sumba. He has over 18 years of experience in the private sector, public service, and entrepreneurship having held leadership positions in technology and government corporations. He is the founder and chief as executive officer at iGov Africa Limited, Boutique Innovation House, and also co-founder of MSafari, a passenger manifest digital payments and data analytics platform that provides the Kenyan government and public transport stakeholders with commuter data insights and helps in contract tra contact tracing with, for COVID-19. He serves as the team leader of Kenya Catalog Jobs Fund and as the head of public sector at Oracle Corporation, Kenya, senior manager for government relations and public sector sales at Safari Com Limited and chairman of Youth Enterprise Development Fund. He's a Tutu Fellow, Aspen Institute graduate and a Kranz Montana leader of tomorrow and serves as trustee of Uzima University and vice chairman of the Uzima University Foundation. With all of those responsibilities, Ronald, we're so thankful that you have set some time to spend with us today. So very warm welcome to you. Um, the next media presenter I would like to highlight, who's going to give us a little bit of an insight uh, into IEEE and the standards work that is, they are doing, is Dr. Porva Rajkotia, who is the Director of Global Business Strategy and Intelligence at the Connectivity and Telecom Practice and the Connectivity and Telecom Practice Lead, I IEEE SA. Prior to IEEE, Corva held leadership positions with Qualcomm, Samsung, and Disney in various capacities. Um, he has an incredible bio, but at the risk of running out of time, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Purva, to tell us a little bit about IEEE standards and the work that you do. Thank you so much, uh, uh, and, uh, and welcome. So in, uh, as, as Mr. Vincent uh, Kabunga mentioned earlier, IEEE, the goal of IEEE is to provide our technology that serves the humanity. And as part of that work effort, we have IEEE SA, which is focused on the standards association. And we are working to develop market relevant open standards and solutions to promote innovation, to promote public safety, healthy and uh, health and well-being, and also to contributing to a, to a sustainable future. Uh, Next slide. Yeah. So um, one of the things I think uh, that was mentioned earlier also that in the in the what what COVID nineteen has actually shown or to the world or what the pandemic has done to the world is the importance of connectivity or it has brought the connectivity to the forefront to to show that how important it uh, it play, uh, it plays a role in everyone's life. So broadband access is going to continue to play an important role in uh, progressing towards the sustainable development goals um, and connecting the unconnected. But the reality though, is that we still have half of the world population that is not connected. Now, if you look at the chart, I mean, it's, 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 it's a small chart, but you'll see that many countries in Africa and in Asia, like more than 50% of the population is still not connected uh, with, 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 uh, with, with internet. Now, there are positive, and also we need to be cognizant of the fact that connectivity is really good, but connectivity, if misused, can also present the challenge. Now, uh, we did actually a survey with, uh, with, with, with many countries, and we found that the connectivity did show a positive impact when it came to education, when it came to economy, when it came to the local culture. But at the same time, the connectivity uh, or, or, or the social media platform that ran on the connectivity platform, uh, connectivity platform did have an, an, a negative impact when it came to the morality, when it came to the physical health, when it came to the children in the society. Uh, the, the other thing, and I think the last few weeks if people have been following what's, what's happening in US is with, with, with the things that came out regarding Facebook in terms of the way the, the, the platform, uh, platform was used, I mean, we we have it's 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 getting very obvious that connectivity, though it's very crucial, though it's played a very important role in the sustainable development goals, 
but connectivity is like a demon. If it's not controlled properly, if we do not have the right tools to, 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 to curtail the connectivity, it could also lead to issues like addiction. It could also lead to issues like misinformation. Uh, the, the, the privacy and the security of the individual is going to be at risk. It also uh, increases the pressure on the day-to-day -day individuals. And we have also seen evidences where for the teenagers, because of the social media platform that's, that's been run on the connectivity platform, could also lead to, uh, could, could also lead to death. Now, from, from IFRI police uh, a goal, so what we want to do here is that we want to create a meaningful connectivity program, a connectivity which is based on the technological component wherein we provide the connectivity either through uh, uh, various mediums like wired medium, wireless medium, uh, satellite communications, all those things should be provided to the team in terms of providing connectivity. And we do actually have programs regarding uh, reg uh, regarding the same, but at the same time, for a meaningful connectivity, what we need is the is the, is the, is the, is, the, is, the, is the respect for the for 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 for, for the user's privacy, is the is 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 the the digital inclusion. It's the uh, it's the uh, the way to provide uh, the the better uh, or, or sustainable uh, sustainable solution, because what we are uh, basically seeing is that as long as we build the connectivity which is based on meaningful connectivity that takes into consideration the well-being of individuals or the human resilience or the digital and uh, dignity and inclusion of the individuals and you build standards surrounding it you actually do create a meaningful connectivity platform and that's what ieee's goal is here so you'll find that the programs that we have right now uh, listed uh, like rural communications uh, like the user centric approach uh, for connectivity open source platform, digital resilience, literacy, uh, inclusive participation, uh, context appropriate technical solutions, context appropriate content, all those things are going to play a very important role in providing a meaningful and digital connectivity and a sustainable solution. Uh, uh, next slide. And so again, uh, again, to make a solution that's more sustainable, we need to create the generation of engineers who are going to work to make sure that we provide them with the skills to, 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 run, to run a network. So IEEE actually has a building wireless community network. It's a technical level, uh, a technician level course uh, that's developed by IEEE SA along with the Internet Society that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that teaches the engineers when it, uh, the, the key aspects of wireless networking standards, networking and troubleshooting to provide a solid foundation for the wireless networks. We actually have a program running with the Indian Ministry of, uh, of Electronics and Information and uh, they, they have trained around like 2,000 uh, VLEs uh, or the or the uh, the village level entrepreneurs to, to 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 learn on that program because that's the only way we see the program to be sustainable. Because for every small issues like we cannot call an engineer, but if the skills are homegrown or if the skills are local grown, then if there are any challenges that could that could very well be addressed. And that's what this uh, the the, uh, the 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 IEEE uh, building uh, building wireless community networks is. Again, the goal here is that the, the, the post COVID nineteen uh, the post COVID nineteen world is going to have a connectivity as a crucial platform. What can IEEE do? Or, or, the, or I just want to highlight the programs that IEEE is doing to provide a meaningful connectivity and a sustainable solution that could be useful for for for, for IEEE. Thank you so much, Porva, for sharing these insights with us. It's exciting to see this work happening and we're eager to continue working closely with you to advance these efforts given the critical nature of um, these programs. Thank you. All right, thank you, <laughs> as it says on the slide. All right, uh, back to Ronald and um, I'm going to, and uh, we're now going to transition into our panel. And our first panelist I'm very uh, proud to introduce uh, is um, Mr. Alex Wong, who serves as the Chief of Special Initiatives in the Office of the Director of uh, the Telecommunications Development Bureau at ITU, uh, which is a United Nations specialized agency for ICTs. In this role, he's leading GIGA, which you will hear about today, um, and which is aiming uh, to connect every school to the internet, every young person to information, opportunity, and choice. Prior to joining ITU, Alex has worked in both the private and nonprofit sectors. He served as president of CGLA Infrastructure, was a member of the executive committee at the World Economic Forum, and headed the Center for Global Industries in Geneva. He has worked in a variety of professional roles at Accenture as a strategy consultant, General Motors as a quality control engineer, and the US National Park Service as well. 
He's a licensed professional engineer with a degree in mechanical engineering from my alma mater, University of Toronto, and a master's in public administration for Harvard. Welcome, Alex. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I believe um, our colleague Marilyn is going to put up a video on screen for you. Welcome. <laughs> How many schools are there in the world? Where are they located? And how many are connected to the internet? Well, the truth is, we don't know it, yet. GIGA, the innovative partnership between ITU and UNICEF, is set to answer these questions. Launched in 2019, GIGA has so far mapped close to a million schools in 40 countries and is actively working to ensure that every child is equipped with the connectivity they need and empowered to shape the future they want. GIGA helps countries map schools and their connectivity, create investment opportunities, identify the most appropriate technologies and high quality, vetted and safe content. GIGA is bringing innovation to education and has been highlighted in the UN Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation and our Common Agenda. Connecting all schools of the world to the internet is an ambitious but necessary undertaking. The time to act is now. Partner with GIGA and help us provide every young person with access to information, opportunity and choice. All right, excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I know we have a small group today, so we can make this much more interactive, I hope, at the end of the session. Uh, but I'm really pleased to be here, and thank you for uh, allowing me to, the opportunity to share what we're doing with Giga. And I think for the audience here or the group here, uh, I want to take it from an approach of how we're, the process of how we're doing it and how, you know, IEEE as a partner could, could, could work with us and perhaps some of you that are listening in. So let me put onto the screen a very brief presentation if I can uh, be allowed to share. I have, I have a, okay, so give me a second. All right, so um, the video already, re already really summarizes, I think the program overall and, and Dr. Purva summarized some of the key statistics um, on why this is such a critical issue, but I'll add in a few additional COVID specific statistics. Um, UNICEF has estimated that about 1.6 billion, billion children have been affected because of COVID in over 190 countries. And out of that, 463 million children and young people don't have internet access at their house. So they do not, they have not been able to benefit from the hybrid learning that probably most of our kids and the younger generation have benefited in from countries like the US or Switzerland. And furthermore, um, in low income countries, only 6% of children and young people have internet access at home. So the need for connectivity has been really enhanced um, and as a, as a global priority now because of things like COVID and the impact on things like education. So it's a real opportunity and a call to action. Uh, we started Giga actually before COVID um, and for over the last two years, we're already uh, have had several accomplishments. Here are some of the, the milestones. And I would actually say that this week, we actually expect to surpass the mapping of a million schools. So why is that important, mapping? So turning to the engineering element of those on the call, um, it's a structured approach. We believe we can get to every school being connected if we can map where every school is located and the connectivity, create then the necessary financing models to spur investment, and then provide the connectivity solutions um, to allow private sector, public-private partnerships to build the connectivity and then leverage um, the platforms of the UN and other organizations to have the right contact, the, the empower pillar, as we call it. So that's the approach we take it. We, we, we break this down further into this 11 step chart, which I don't have time to go through, but how we systematically work with each of our uh, country partners to uh, advance them on the journey towards achieving school connectivity and universal connectivity. Um, when we work with the country, I wanna highlight this slide really briefly because 
you know, in the end, this is a partnership with the country, and we're not going to be able to succeed if we don't have the political leadership and support and the corresponding su supporting strategies and regulatory environment. But fourth, four way down into the bullet point about access to data, I've talked to before with IEEE colleagues about what a complementary um, partnership to figure out how IEEE on the ground can help us understand what is the current connectivity, where the current school is located, and we're having some various conversations there. Um, and of course, in the end, we want to make sure that we create the right environment uh, for connectivity and, and all the girls and all the all the citizens, regardless of, of their age and, and gender, that have, have the right and equitable access. Um, last slide here is just to show you what we've been doing in Africa specifically. Out of the 19 active giga countries, in particular, I'd highlight Kenya, uh, Niger, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and Zimbabwe. That's where we're actively working uh, with the governments, and we've had some early successes, uh, both tied to connectivity, but also some of the um, policy regulatory changes that need to happen. Um, and we have many other countries that are uh, expressed interest and who we're beginning some conversations with. And as, as I said, the mapping is one of the first steps we do is to identify where every school is located and what's the current connectivity. So I'll stop there in the interest of time, and um, I hope that's a perhaps a really quick overview of what we've been doing in GIGA and in particular in Africa. Uh, back to you, and thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, all right, uh, next up, uh, we are going to have uh, Josephine Melitza. And um, Marilyn, if I can trouble you to share the screen, please. Unless you prefer that I do it. There we go. All right. All right. So uh, Josephine is a network engineer who is passionate about closing the connectivity divide and helping communities leverage technology for social economic empowerment. She is the lead network engineer at Tuna Panda Net project, where she focuses on building a digital ecosystem in education and health for rural and informal settlements in Kenya, particularly providing connectivity and digital literacy training for schools, youth centers, and healthcare facilities in Kibera, which is located in Nairobi. Josephine has excellent working knowledge of networking technologies with specialization being community wireless networks. She's a recognized leader, dependable team member, and progressive thinker, an impact-oriented person, oriented person with a drive to make the world a better place. And we are so thankful to have her here. Josephine, over to you. Thank you, and thank you for this invitation. Uh, today, I just like to highlight uh, some of the work that uh, community networks are doing with regards to um, connectivity in the COVID-19 era. So as previously shared, um, the pandemic exposed and amplified uh, digital inequalities uh, that existed, um, that exist between the connected and unconnected communities. And in Africa, for example, the response has been largely online. It meant that the unconnected were excluded, not just from um, just the access to the internet, um, access to the internet, but also um, much needed uh, information and services that affect livelihoods, education, and health. Um, over the last decade, we've seen uh, growth in terms of the first mile. So in Africa, we've seen an increase in uh, undersea cables connecting the continent. Uh, we've also seen growth in middle mile. Uh, many countries have deployed uh, national fiber optic infrastructure. However, we're still experiencing a great, um, especially with regards to broadband, uh, great divides uh, in terms of the last mile. And one of the reasons, um, that rural and remote areas remain unconnected. Uh, it's because they do not make um, business case uh, for many commercial operators. And um, last year, uh, APC, which is Association for Progressive Communications, uh, together with Kikanet, uh, collaborated with the um, Communications Authority of Kenya uh, to develop a framework uh, for um, licensing and shared spectrum framework for community networks. In this exercise, we engage with some operators in, um, in Kenya and some of the reasons or challenges that they mentioned with regards to providing affordable access included high uh, spectrum fees, licensing, uh, backhaul cost, as well as um, the lack of supporting infrastructures uh, such as bad roads and um, 
bad roads and, and electricity. And that is why um, it is important to explore uh, other complementary access models, such as community networks that uh, you can see in this slide. So what are community networks? Uh, these are complementary access models that are built with, by, and for the communities. Um, they are crowdsourced networks where communities come together and then build infrastructure based on their local needs and priorities. Uh, they also take a holistic approach to digital inclusion in that they do not just tackle uh, the connectivity gap, but they also look at other aspects such as um, localization of content and also provision of uh, digital platforms that meet local needs. How are these networks started and operated? Majority of them are start with a champion. Uh, so it can be someone from the community or outside the community collaborating with um, community members. For instance, uh, one of the community networks, Pamojanet, which is uh, located in an, in an island called Ijui in DRC, uh, one is initiated by an organization called La Difference um, with a request from uh, the community king, or they call them Muamis, um, who wanted uh, an opportunity to create or a platform to create more opportunities for youth. Uh, Zenzeleni is another example of a community network in Eastern Cape South Africa, which was started uh, through a collaboration between university researchers and the local communities. And then lastly, um, Bosco Uganda has its roots in the Catholic Church, which was started um, uh, quite a number of years back, I believe it's uh, over 10 years ago, during a time when Northern Uganda was experiencing um, the insurgency. So the models vary from community to community. Um, we have cooperative models such as Tanzania in South Africa. We have also NGO or CBO models in countries such as Uganda, Nigeria, DRC, and Zimbabwe. And, and while others uh, sprout uh, from growth of um, community radio such as Macha Works in Zambia. However, in all instances, it's important to note that uh, local authorities are, are involved uh, and especially like traditional um, local authorities. So Zenzeleni, for example, uh, we have the headmen um, from both villages uh, where the community network is in Mankosi and Zitulele. Uh, in DRC, as mentioned before, uh, we also have support from uh, the local king on Ormuami. Technologies used are mostly Wi-Fi uh, because of affordability uh, of equipment and also because this is an unlicensed spectrum um, and service provision uh, follows different uh, models. So we see um, where they have hotspots, uh, community hotspots. Uh, they also have private hotspots and some connect to community centers. In all these instances, in all these instances, sorry, communities build uh, the infrastructure themselves are seen in the picture. Uh, the youth are the ones actually who build the mass and also support in terms of, uh, of the deployment. So in other, yeah, so it's youth, it's women just coming together uh, to support in building the infrastructure. So this helps in terms of lowering the cost of deployment and also supports in building uh, local capacities. All the three mentioned or the ones that you can see on the screen community networks are powered by solar. As we know in most, Afri in most African countries, especially rural areas, uh, this is quite a challenge. And a good example is actually Bosco Uganda, uh, which has built um, solar plants. Um, so one for six kilowatt and two for 30 kilowatt. And the grids not only power the community networks, but also uh, schools and local businesses. Uh, and local businesses. During the pandemic, uh, community networks um, are similar to, you know, like in the telecommunication sector where we saw a growth uh, or an increase in terms of demand. Uh, so there was um, quite, um, increase in terms of demand for connectivity from the community. I think in a way it served as a silver lining uh, in terms of adapt, it's accelerated adoption to, or adoption of, uh, of the internet. We also saw community networks provide support to their communities. As in the learning, for example, translated, translated health information into, the, uh, into local languages uh, and also provided zero rated 
uh, websites. And also another example is Malawi, um, Bosco and Tunapandanet, who uh, now took on the role of building capacities uh, for teachers and also providing uh, e-learning e -learning content. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, I think uh, there is value in, in ensuring that we support bottom-up strategies in, uh, in last mile connectivity. Um, and some of the recommendations that I have, I will not go through all the ones, in this, uh, all the ones mentioned on the screen uh, on this slide, but just a few include dedicate um, support through funding and financing uh, from funds such as the Universal Service Access Fund. Um, there's also establishment of interconnection points. Access to backhaul is still a major challenge. And so given that governments have deployed uh, nat national open access networks, it will be great if community networks uh, can be able to tap into this. And then lastly, um, in relation to um, open telecom data, we would um, recommend that uh, operators uh, can make publicly available uh, data on issues such as network infrastructure. Um, this can be where you know, the different uh, point of presence for the fiber optic networks, uh, tower locations, uh, information around uh, spectrum and licensing. Uh, and this will be enable, uh, this will enable a more public discussion around what are the gaps and what we can do to be able to address them. Um, thank you. Thank you, Josephine, for that insight to uh, the realities on the ground. And uh, next up, we have Juanita Clark, who is the co-founder and CEO of the Digital Council Africa, a not-for-profit industry association, which is headquartered in South Africa, where she is joining us from today. This is an independent association that acts as a bridge and connector between the government, technology industry, and interested parties across Africa and seeks to establish an efficient telecommunications environment through the development of best practices, standards, policies, and guidelines. Um, Juanita co-founded the organization in 2010 after realizing the need for grassroots awareness and education with regards to the role of broadband networks in the telecommunications industry. So I'm going to turn it over to Juanita to tell us a bit more about her extraordinary work in the sector. Thank you very much, um, Iana, and thank you um, for the invitation to um, join you today, um, uh, you know, discussing this um, really um, important uh, topic. So just by way of introduction, the Digital Council Africa is an industry association, as mentioned, um, and we work with government and private sector to create awareness for the di digital divide um, and to find sustainable solutions for bridging the di digital divide. It's a tongue twister this afternoon. Um, so um, I think that we can all agree that the pandemic has really accelerated the, the, the pace at which, um, you know, globally, the world has adopted um, digitalization. Um, unfortunately, I think you know what we're seeing in Africa is that you know the the places that were originally marginalized, marginalized have become further marginalized, and this is something that really should be a, a grave concern um, to all of us. So, just by way of um, introduction, I just want to um, draw a small comparison between um, where Africa is currently standing, and then of course um, you know where we are as um, you know from a global perspective. Um, so if we look at um, globally, we can see a mobile connectivity, unique subscriber penetration is currently standing at approximately 68%. Um, we've got about 4,854 co-location uh, data centers in 129 countries outside of Africa. Um, so some really phenomenal numbers is 4.94 million towers um, have been built across the world um, by um, either uh, mobile network operators or tower co's. Um, if we look at the IoT and devices market, we can see that there's approximately 12 billion IoT um, connections. Uh, globally, we have about 72% uh, smartphone penetration. 
Um, there's um, from an international connectivity point of view, um, you know, if we look at the penetration, we can see the adoption of penetration um, with, uh, you know, uh, and how and how that has grown globally. Um, you know, we look at the adoption of 5G technologies, 8% um, uh, uh, growth in 5G, 14%, um, you know, uh, of the, the global market still on 2G. Um, there's 21% on 3G and approximately 57% uh, on 4G. Um, from a fixed uh, connectivity point of view, um, last mile household penetration has grown substantially in 2020 um, and um, sitting at 58.6%, fixed wireless access at 5%, FTTH and FTTB uh, penetration at 35%. Um, unlike Africa, there's still 8% um, penetration on cable, DSL sitting at 20%, and then other connectivity methodologies sitting at approximately 0.6%. Um, um, now, these are not uh, like impressive numbers if we take into consideration, you know, that the globally we are trying to achieve ubiquitous access. The concern comes in if we go to the next slide. If we look at mobile connectivity and unique subscriber numbers, remember that we said that the global number was 68%, so almost 70% there versus an almost 50% um, connectivity in Africa. So remember, we said that um, globally there were 4,854 data centers in, um, in 129 countries. If you compare that with Africa, we've only got 79 co-location data centers in approximately 14 countries. Now, South Africa has taken the lead in the data center market, and we know that there's continuously new announcements being made. The latest announce, uh, announcement by Vantage announcing a one billion US dollar um, uh, data center to be built in Johannesburg. Um, we know that Africa Data Center has uh, invested 300 million US dollars in, in their new data center. Um, yeah, there's uh, Terraco have just massively expanded their uh, data centers. And we know that Oracle has also made an announcement that they will be finally breaking ground in a new data center in Johannesburg. Um, and then, of course, NTT have also made similar, uh, you know, noises that they'll be building um, and, and uh, you know, investing in, in Africa. Um, and, um, and of course, there's the ongoing expansion of other data centers. But if you consider 79%, um, you know, data centers in 14 countries in Africa compared to 4,854 data centers, there's an immense opportunity for investment. Now, just below that, if we look at tower infrastructure, um, 169,000 towers. And to just remind you that the number for the global tower penetration is 4.94 million towers. So again, a, a lot of opportunity. Um, and I just want to pick up with what just you know, Josephine was saying, you know, for, for us, what we find some of the greatest barriers to the deployment of tower infrastructure is um, cumbersome processes with um, municipalities and local authorities and, um, and, and, and counties that simply haven't got the capacity or um, are actively um, you know, still rent seeking um, in this regard. We need to streamline our processes and procedures to deploy um, telecommunications infrastructure. Um, there's also, I mean, a, a lot of, um, negative aspects and, and and it's phenomenal how Josephine was playing uh, was saying about how they include the communities in the deployment of infrastructure so this initial buy-in from the communities um, in the deployment of the infrastructure um, a, a very nasty thing in, in Africa unfortunately is the sabotage of uh, telecommunications infrastructure deployment um, which which remains a concern so all of these things really slows down the pace at which we deploy infrastructure um, also, um, site acquisition, you know, where we can deploy infrastructure. Still a lot of fake news surrounding the deployment of 5G um, and other, um, you know, tower infrastructure, um, you know, associated with the pandemic. Um, so a lot of work that needs to be done. If you look at the IoT uh, devices, um, you know, in South Africa, we've got approximately, in Africa, apologies, we've got approximately 24 million IoT connections. Um, Globally, there's 12 billion IoT connections. So 
a tremendous amount of, of work that needs to um, be done. Um, one of the areas um, that that's uh, quite exciting, if we look at global infrastructure um, market, is is like I said, the growth in the data center um, market and the data center adoption. Um, another area that I want to highlight is just OTT. You know. Um, Globally, we see that there's 218 billion apps um, that was downloaded in, in 2020. Um, and um, in, in Africa, only 25 billion apps, you know, in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is very specific to Sub-Saharan Africa. So we need to really focus on, um, on how we can extend this connectivity. Our fixed broadband penetration is only sitting at 2.2%. Um, our fiber adoption, fiber to the home, fiber to the business adoption, only at 1.1%, um, DSL at 0.6%, uh, um, fixed wireless access only at 0.3%, um, cable at 0.1%, and um, other uh, methodologies for connectivity only at 0.1%. Um, our social media penetration, um, you know, in active social media users um, in the rest of the world, 4.5 uh, billion users with a 53% per, uh, penetration rate. Um, and in um, Southern Africa, Western Africa, and Middle Eastern Africa, you know, we can still see that those numbers dwindle really far behind the rest of the world. Um, if we're going to overcome and, um, you know, capitalize on, and, you know, we can, we can very easily just see this in a negative light, but we can also see it as an immense opportunity. You know, while we're seeing some uh, form of maturity and saturation in the rest of the world, um, Africa provides this uh, immense opportunity for investment, for growing this, for building additional data centers, um, the deployment of fiber optic in infrastructure. Um, we've had massive expansion in our international bandwidth with uh, new cables consistently landing um, on our shores. Um, um, and opportunities to now take this band with inline, inland and to connect everybody. But if we're really going to focus on overcoming um, our connectivity issues and making sure that we connect every single person on the continent, we've got to look at, at all three areas. It's, it's, not a, it's not just about connectivity. Connectivity is, is one of the most important parts, but, but we focus a trilemma um, it's a connectivity, of course, is very important. The other aspect that uh, that sometimes is overlooked is the access to devices. You know, it's not so smartphones um, remains unaffordable for a lot of people. So finding affordable um, devices that can be made available to low income households is, is really important. And we saw, um, you know, similarly, to um, what uh, Mr. Rakotia was saying is that, you know, in the pandemic, you know, there was this further marginalization of, of young people that couldn't continue to um, access uh, educational platforms because, you know, connectivity is not affordable. So we know that it's still way too expensive in Africa. Um, secondly, they didn't have access to devices. And thirdly, before there was mass zero rating of educational content, um, the content, you know, simply wasn't uh, accessible to people. So we have to focus on all three, it's access to devices, access to connectivity and access to content, if we're going to make sure that Africa becomes um, as connected as, as the rest of the world. Um, but yeah, I, I think for now, that's it from my side. I think it's a conversation that we can all talk about for a really long time. Um, and if we don't stop ourselves, then um, we're going to keep going. So I'm going to hand back to you. Thanks, Iana. Thank you so much, Juanita. And um, we do want to uh, note in, in a kind of classic twist, uh, Dr. Bello Musa, who was today in transit to Tanzania from Dubai, um, has unfortunately found that it's, uh, his connectivity is not sufficient for him to be able to join us. So we are going to go ahead and start with uh, some questions for our incredible panelists right now. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Ronald Asumba to take us through. Thanks a lot, Yana. And, and you know, wow, just fantastic uh, presentations. And all of you are doing fantastic work, you know, across the continent and in other parts of the world. So uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, maybe just to start by introducing myself. My name is Ronald Osumba. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya, and um, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called iGov. 
Tiger of Africa basically is an innovation house that focuses on working with different players in the ecosystem to support technology for good. Um, we have a particular focus for GovTech. So how do we support governments um, in Africa to leverage technology to improve service delivery, whether that's in education, healthcare, agriculture, and, and the typical day-to-day -day services provided to citizens. Um, we also work you know, pretty well with um, uh, problem solvers, so identifying people who are solving problems, uh, building things. Of course, we all know now Africa is, the, is, 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 is a silicon savannah, so in a manner of speaking, and a hot, hotbed for innovation. And we are trying to find all these startups, developers who are building things to just build their capacity, connect them to market, but also connect them to financing. We've worked quite a bit with uh, development partners, you know, whether that's um, a DFID, uh, we've worked with government, um, we've worked with uh, partners like Engineering for Change to conduct um, research and surveys. And um, uh, pretty much what we then do is come at the tail end of the work that you're doing, which is once there is connectivity, how do we leverage connectivity to build services on it so that you know the citizens on the continent can be able to um, access those services, but also just to transform their lives from an economic perspective, a social perspective, etc. Um, you know, and 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 I just want to now just dive into the question and answer, and I will just kick off with um maybe a question to alex and josephine because uh, I, I i see an, an an intersect between the work you're doing which is empowering communities alex obviously looking at empowering our future techies when they're still young ensuring they have connectivity and devices in their hands and josephine working with communities to ensure that there are locally enabled infrastructure that is providing access to the internet but the big question then is how do we sustain this kind of interventions if they're not commercially viable and i think Justin, you alluded to that and i probably will start with you Justin, in terms of how do we keep this community networks running in the long term i know you alluded to reduction of um, um, of uh, the cost of setting up the networks using local skills to build uh, base stations and stuff like that but how do we what's the commercial model behind it and while you're at it for all the other panelists please remember there's a q a section uh, at the bottom of the screen and you can continue to answer the questions that are popping up there they're already two and, and more coming up over to you just thank you um I think first is just to say that uh, just because the networks or community networks are not for profit does not mean they have to offer uh, maybe, for example, free access to the internet because uh, we understand that, you know, infrastructure, you know, it costs to, to get the equipment, it costs to maintain the infrastructure as well. And so the main, I think, aspect uh, where support is required is at the CAPEX level where you're getting into a community for example in some communities they are able maybe to crowdsource for resources uh, but in majority it's really quite challenging to get the initial you know uh, for example funds to buy equipment funds for bandwidth because you are working with communities uh, that may not even have been exposed to what you know like internet access or other uh, forms of ict so you're sort of getting in to build the market or um, to build adoption and inclusion from ground up. Uh, so majority of the networks have been privileged to get access to grants uh, from organizations such as the Internet Society, Association of Progressive Communications. Uh, we are also seeing um, 
some being funded um, maybe through USF, as in the case of Argentina. Uh, but in the long run, in terms of sustaining operations, we see great business models. So I'll give an example of uh, Zenzeleni Community Networks, where I think in the past three years, they have been able to sustain their OPEX just from revenue uh, that is generated from the community. So they build this two-layer um, a two-layer business model where you have uh, community hotspots and then you have businesses. Uh, so the community package is more affordable to community members. So for 20 rand a month, uh, someone is able to get uh, access to the internet, but then you have other businesses uh, within the community. So for example, backpackers, uh, health um, uh, hospitals who are able to pay uh, or other NGOs that are in the area and would be able to pay um, a substantial amount to maintain uh, the cost. So I think because uh, especially in rural areas, there is no other means for people to access. Uh, it's just the initial capital that is important. And then afterwards the community networks now uh, transition to more uh, uh, like um, sustainable uh, business models. And, and thanks for that. I mean, yes, obviously, you know, you have the supply side, I guess, sorted from a from an operating perspective. And, and you know, this small opcos, if we, if we can call them that, can find, you know, a, a competitive edge from your commercial entities, and therefore they, you know, they can charge lower but have more users, if you like. But that then still leaves the demands, the, the, the supply side uh, on infrastructure financing. And I guess that's where you come in, Alex, uh, in terms of, you know, what are the options available for not just, you know, the community networks, but even for large scale commercial players who are saying, you know, I'm not going to build a network in a place that is rural, sparsely populated, you know, with no content that will drive usage. Um, so how do I make my business sustainable from an infrastructure perspective? Right, thank you. So actually on Giga, we actually take the approach that if we can help move um, the financing and move the uh, activity to connect every school with sufficient connectivity, and we define that as ideally at least 10 megabyte per second, but optimally 20 megabyte per second. So that connectivity gives a video experience with a child, uh, interactive experience. But if we can actually connect that to the school, which then can then serve as a hub to connect the net, the, the community. So really the connectivity to the school is the backhaul. It's, an, it's the core, it's a, it's a big enough pipe that it can connect the school, but also connect the community. So that's what Giga is trying to do because we're trying to address one of the fundamental issues with last mile connectivity solutions. And Josephine maybe alluded to this is a lot of these, community networks, you need backhaul to be able to work. A lot of last mile connectivity projects fail. In fact, Christopher Yu, who is a good friend and he runs One World Connected and they did all this research on, on last mile connectivity models He's at University of Pennsylvania. One of the reasons why projects fail is they don't have enough backhaul. And that cost is too significant to maintain the overall business model. So we sort of see Giga as, I don't wanna say it's a public good, but if it's, it's a duty of government to play a key role to get every school connected, and then you can use last mile, a variety of last mile connectivity technologies to connect the network of which community network is certainly one very viable option. In fact, one of the pieces of work we draw on from uh, for Giga is ITU published a whole guide on last mile connectivity uh, solutions. So when is the right appropriate technology to use in which situation? And again, community networks is, 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 is that. The second thing that we're drawing to do on Giga, and I skipped through the 11 steps really quickly, but there's a whole chunk of steps about the policy regulatory framework, because we know that there are some countries where it's technically illegal to run a community network, because you're basically using unlicensed, you're using unlicensed spectrum or using spectrum that's maybe not supposed to be. And you, um, as some of you know, I mean, many of you probably know, you know, technically to be according to the law, you need to be an operator, a licensed operator, which is ridiculous for a small community network. So we wanna, in Giga, work with the regulators and governments to put in the right policy regulatory framework to enable these kinds of opportunities uh, as well. That's the second um, key point that I would make. And finally, and Ronald, you didn't know this, but you teed it up perfectly. I think it'll be today. We are, we are launching a report 
um, that we just completed with Boston Consulting Group that was actually about trying to figure out how you create sustainable community operating models for connectivity. And we looked at, uh, we looked at um, in Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, there's and then Nigeria. We did case studies to assess based on how much it will cost to connect a community. A, a typical community in Rwanda, for example, 700 people will cost about 4,000 a year in OPEX. We did, we did all this analysis, microeconomic analysis. And so how do you finance connectivity? And the conclusion is you can't do it from public financing alone, which is why it's not been done. You have to come up with public private models. And one model is using energy. So if you introduce the energy, which of course is equally a challenge, uh, and the energy industry and the industry energy players, you introduce another revenue stream in addition to the community providing a revenue stream, um, which I'm sure Josephine has lots of examples because Zenzalini is a great example. We did a whole case study on Zenzalini of how you then create some of the financing. But I guess going back to Giga, that's definitely a piece, but we want to create also the backhaul through the connecting to every school. And we want to um, help use the ITU, um, you know, our role as, as, as a technical agency is working with governments on the policy regulatory framework that enables connectivity, uh, such as things like community networks. Thanks, thanks. Great answer. And, 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 and I mean, you know, obviously still a lot of modeling to be done, particularly around the private uh, public uh, partnerships on how we can have this infrastructure financing. And I just want to bring, I mean, I had another question around how we guarantee return on investment, but I think let's bring in the other speakers. I see, you know, I had a question for, for Juanita and I see, you know, an anonymous attendee also asking pretty much around the same thing. Um, how, you know, I mean, bringing in connectivity to the community is one thing, but how then do we close the gap using devices? And then we will take it one step further and say, how do we ensure that there's relevant local content in a language that people can understand? But sticking on the device access and, I want to combine this with the previous question I had for you. How do we leapfrog um, infra? Is there, is there a, a thinking on how to bring in, you know, new age technology like IoT, which you alluded to, that can then help us to leapfrog? And once we're able to then, you know, close this gap, how do we ensure that there's locally manufactured, locally available, smart enough devices that people can afford or share within those communities. So if you like shared, shared devices platform. Thanks, thank you for that, Ronald. Um, so let's just start with the devices. So, so devices is also closely linked to uh, digital readiness. So we have to train our communities on how to use the devices. So, but just to, to talk around the devices and, um, you know, I'm looking at my colleagues um, and including you and, um, Hands up if somebody's got a device or three lying in a drawer somewhere, you know. So we've got so many devices that we haven't used and that we are not using, but there's nothing wrong with them. They need to be sanitized. We need to just clean them up and they've still got a bit of life in them. So that's one of the ways that, you know, we can really empower our communities is to put a a, a, a massive push into place where we start redistributing these devices. So not only is it good um, and, you know, great for communities to provide young people with connectivity to make sure that we've got at least a device per household, um, you know, to help people, um, you know, to get connected. Um, it's just phenomenal for the environment, you know, from an e-waste point of view, a lot of secondhand devices just ends up in landfills, you know, something lies in a drawer for five or seven years and then people look at it and, you know, they, they throw it away. But I think that there's an opportunity for operators to get involved and to start a global movement where we start collecting these devices. When people upgrade their devices, they should have the option to donate an old one. Uh, we should have collection points. Um, so just let's just think about this. Let's use an example. Imagine the amount of devices that come out of our national governments annually because they upgrade devices. You know, there's the three-year lifespan, span, something in, uh, reaches end of life. Um, and um, there are storerooms and storerooms and storerooms full of devices that literally sit in governments corporates, just corporate America, corporate South Africa, corporate Asia, um, you know, corporate Africa, you know, the amount of devices that are upgraded, while there's really nothing wrong with the old device, and it needs a bit of refurbishment 
to be cleaned up and, uh, you know, sanitize the data, make sure that, you know, there's not a nice selfie of, you know, the girlfriend and everybody else on there and like, you know, and, and, and they've got a, you know, they've got a great life. But, um, but we've got to put these mechanisms in place and we've got to think uh, beyond it. And, and one of the things that you just raised now is local manufacturing. You know, there's uh, an immense opportunity. As Africans, we always look outside the continent, you know, it's, and, and there's a mentality from us that, you know, everything from America is better and everything from everywhere else is better when, I mean, we have shown that we've got the capability right here on our continent that we can, you know, be manufacturers, that we can create. I mean, we, um, but often we struggle with the price point, you know, it's very expensive for us to, to manufacture here. Um, and it's so much cheaper to bring it in from overseas and, you know, products are brought in at, at half the price of, of what we can manufacture. And then again, it's this fight with the corporates to, uh, to convince them to still buy local. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but I really think that there are opportunities for us to collaborate and to do things and to move the needle and to um, you know, and to, to scale some of our projects. Um, and it's not just about devices. I mean, we need to manufacture our own fiber optic infrastructure. We need to manufacture uh, a lot of our telco equipment, you know, needs to be, um, you know, we need to stimulate innovation in Africa. We need to create platforms where people are free to think and free to create and um, to, to provide them with hubs where they can, um, you know, participate in, you um, and it's not just um, it's just not readily available for most um, Africans, unfortunately. So, um, you know, access to devices is just um, the first step. Um, and um, and I think, you know, that we can we can really do something if we start some initiatives to, um, you know, to distribute those devices. The biggest problem with the distribution of devices is that once you've put somebody in that digital economy, you've got to find ways of keeping them in that economy. You know, you've dropped a phone, I've dropped a phone, that happens. So what we need to do is when that happens, we need to be in a position where we can replace that device or create local jobs by empowering young people to fix devices so that those, you know, so that we don't put somebody in, in the economic, uh, the digital economy, and then something goes wrong with the device and then they're removed from that. We've got to just find sustainable ways. Um, but we're all smart people. I'm sure we can all come up with um, some good solutions if we, we talk and put our heads together. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for that answer. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be coming back to you, Alex, shortly. There's a question in the Q&A section. We just go into it. I think the first question was for you. I'll come back to you shortly, but let me just bring in uh, Purva because you have you know, made a strong case in terms of how we build standards. We, we, you, you, you came with the numbers and we can be able to see that, um, you know, putting more people into access of infrastructure will have positive impact, but we've seen a bit of negative impact, but on the whole, more positive impact. I think the question then for, for me is, how do we communicate this uh, return on investments and standards to governments across Africa? How do we get them to act? And to a specific question from Gordon Day, who I'm told is a former uh, uh, president of IEEE, what national policies and international agreements are needed to, uh, to accelerate this access in Africa? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think there are, there are two aspects to this question. There is one aspect that we can talk about in, in terms of what are the governmental policies that would be required to provide connectivity. Uh, and then there is the other aspect as to what kind of governmental regulations and agreements that we need to have to provide meaningful connectivity. Now, when, when I say connectivity over here, I basically mean in terms of infrastructure. Because one of the things that we have seen is that, that there is a stark digital divide in this world. We have people that, that uh, and even within US uh, compared to say uh, Korea or Japan, where if you look at fiber, Japan and Korea, they have the fiber deployment which is around like 75% plus more. But if you look at US, it's around 15%. UK, it's even less, it's around 2%. And I, I saw the, uh, the chart that one, one is actually shared, wherein we see that even in Africa, it's less than 1%. So that digital difference that, that has been highlighted needs to be bridged over. 
we need to build a bridge to 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 to, to overcome that uh, uh the, the, that that gulf that that separates that that separates the countries that separates the people and for that government has got a very important role to play because they have to invest a lot in infrastructure development the second thing that we uh, need to talk about is what Josephine mentioned uh, for connectivity, Wi-Fi is going to play a very important role. I mean, we uh, there are different connectivity solutions, but Wi-Fi is definitely going to play an important role. And if you look at Wi-Fi connection, connectivity, it's uh, basically been run on an unlicensed spectrum. And that is where, again, governmental policies will have to be set up to release the additional spectrum, the unlicensed spectrum, on which the Wi-Fi connectivity to be, uh, needs to be provided. If we look at some of the countries, say in US and in, um, in Latin America, they have released a spectrum around six gigahertz. But we need to, we need to do the same thing in Africa. We need to release the six gigahertz spectrum so that Wi-Fi connectivity could be provided so that we can bring in this connectivity more to the users. So again, these are like a couple of, uh, and again, the, the third thing that we have found, and I think this is what even Alex mentioned, is on the backhaul. The backhaul is going to have a very important role, a significant role in terms of providing connectivity, because unless until you have a backhaul that that that's been uh, the, the, that's that's ready to to take your front hall traffic back, it's it, it's it becomes really meaningless because you could have, you could provide the five G connectivity on your front on the, on your on your on your radio towers and antennas, but you don't have the supporting backhaul. All the data gets 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 wasted. So again, the, the backhaul uh, deployment, the, the 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 provisioning that the government will have to do in terms of setting up uh, the, uh, the the intercontinental uh, fiber optics between that runs from Africa to say North America or to Europe or to Asia. All those things is where the government will have to play an important role in setting up the infrastructure, releasing the spectrum, setting up the backhaul, uh, setting up the policies that is going to be um, uh, meaningful. Now let's come to the meaningful connectivity, and that is the portion that, that will highlight more on what can government do in terms of uh, uh, making sure that the connectivity that's been, been provided to the people is not being exploited. Now we actually have like two different models if we, if we look into uh, uh, for, for, pro, for, for, for social media usage. You have the model that, that that's promoted in US wherein like it's free for everyone, like people can do anything that they want in terms of social media platform. And then we have a model that I think um, China is proposing wherein basically they are going to limit the amount of hours that a kid can spend on social media platforms. So these are like two different, actually two extreme models that we are seeing in terms of what, the, uh, what could be done in, in terms of providing connectivity. Now, I'm not a proponent of either, either one of them, but I think this is where the governmental regulations or policies will have to come into play in terms of making sure that the misinformation that has been pro promoted on social media platform, that there, are, there is some kind of policing that's been done over there. There is also some, uh, we, we need to be, sh be sure that, uh, that uh, the, 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 the content that's been provided or, or the user identity, that we have a security or, or the, the cyber security that's been provided for the content that's been sent on this on this uh, on this kind of connectivity platforms because the, the cases of, of 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 fraud of cyber threats all these things are are very obvious or all these things are something that is that is being seen by the uh, by, by, by 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 the users and by the consumers so this is where we see like governmental playing an important role in terms of providing uh, providing uh, the, 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 the 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 right kind of tools when it comes to cyber security, the right kind of tools to provide digital inclusion, right kind of tools to provide uh, the, the, the dignity and the, the, the trust associated with the content, uh, uh, the, the right kind of tools or, or provisioning that is going to make sure that the, the, the users are secure enough onto the, onto, the, onto the cyber world. And that's where I see like the, 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 the infrastructure and the lights on the spectrum side of technology provisioning. And then you have this uh, 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 the, the tools that the government will have to play to make sure that the content that's been provided is properly uh, curated for the for for the user. And that's where I see the government play an important role. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that answer. A quick one for you uh, uh, as we begin to start thinking about wrapping up. How do you replicate the? I think you called it CSC. That is that is running in India. How do you replicate that in in, in Africa? So I think the the CSC model uh, is actually a very interesting model. What we can do is that in the in the uh, the, the program actually started with 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 the, uh, when we started this whole pilot program about providing connectivity in the small village. 
what was eventually found is that the that to run those even basic Wi-Fi access points, uh, it could be very simple thing as like the connectivity the, the connector came out. But if the people are not aware of it, then they had to uh, wait a few days till the technician actually came and he just came and uh, plugged the plugged the internet cable. To so to avoid all these things, IEEE actually provides a program, uh, the, the, the the community build uh, the, the program that that I, that I mentioned earlier. What we can do is that if you want to do, uh, if you if you want to uh, build uh, build that kind of program, we can actually provide a training to all the learners uh, the, about the basics about what needs to be done. Like when when a particular uh, access point is been uh, is been uh, deployed or the common services center center program uh, is 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 been deployed, we we will go and train the village level entrepreneurs uh, to see like what needs to be done in terms of building the community networks. Uh, we IEEE offers blended learning program. So if people are interested, what we will basically do is we'll provide the blended learning program. And again, one of the things I want to also highlight that this program can also be offered in the local languages. It is not just limited to English because we one of the things that we have seen uh, through our through our efforts is that people are more comfortable in their local languages when it, we are when we are talking about rural communities or when we are talking about community buildup. So this program is something that could be that could be taught in the local languages wherein we go and we provide uh, the village level entrepreneurs with this training program, we, we spend time with them, we make them eff uh, efficient, and that's where, where, where we start uh, the building, uh, building the, uh, the, 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 the program and uh, the, the whole community, the, the, the common services center, the CSC program is built surrounding it. So it's it's a joint collaboration with IEEE with the local village level entrepreneurs, and IEEE basically provides a training to them on on the tools, and that's how we actually build this whole CSC program. Fantastic. Possible collaboration areas there with uh, with Josephine, I, I, I suppose. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'll, come, I'll come back to you, Alex. I, there's the, I know you have responded to the question, but I just want to read it out loud so then you can, you can maybe quickly respond to it. And the question was, what do you find is the most effective way to increase digital literacy of the teachers so that they're able to effectively teach the students in schools where GIGA has been set up? Also, have you found much issue around lack of access to devices capable of utilizing the internet access Giga is providing or is providing device access a part of your program? Yeah, so I, I basically said that we wanted to keep the laser focus of Giga on the connectivity, uh, fully recognizing that the skills and the content and the awareness um, you know, the demand side are equally important. I mean, if you don't have that, then you don't have the outcome. So that's why, um, I mean, UNICEF as a core partner of Giga means also accessing the full resources of UNICEF in each country. So it's quite how, how we actually work as Giga, which is I2 and UNICEF, focusing on the connectivity, and then the broader UNICEF and other UN agencies, as well as, frankly, civil society, private sector has a role to play in play to play to, to focus on these other areas. Um, and we're very happy that that is how it works. And I put into the chat that that's why you do need the government leadership to also coordinate that. So you're not, you know, and that's of course um, uh, where we also want to try to provide some on in the in-country support for that. Uh, but but that's how the pieces have to fit together. I mean, devices. In fact, um, I too is also part of the broadband commission, and we are actually launching a working group in this uh, next month on affordable devices. So uh, I, I note that uh, this is a topic that there's been a lot of work on, but we're gonna be working on um, this particular focus in, uh, in, as part of the Broadband Commission to come out with a report on where are we with this and what's the situation. Smart Africa is a very good partner of ours. Juanita, I know you're doing a lot of work on devices that we need to um, focus up on. So I think that's a great question and it's a great uh, uh, topic. It needs more thought. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Alex. Uh, and, and Juanita, your hands are up, so please take it on. I just wanted to add to what Alex was saying, um, you know, and, and um, you know, they've got a core focus on connectivity. I think in, in this case, um, you know, if we can get the connectivity in place, you don't, you know, the teachers can, can learn with the class. So if we can get the connectivity in place, you can have a remote person teaching everybody how to use tech and, you know, and they, they, they use it and learn while, you know, they connect it remotely. So they get firsthand experience of how it works. And the teacher in the classroom also learns with the children. There's, um, there's this, this mass like sort of focus for me on people saying, how do we train teachers and how do we train teachers? We've got to get to every individual teacher. 
there's no reason for me why the teachers can't learn with a classroom and everybody come up together and we lift as we rise. Um, but we have to get the connectivity there first. But yeah, Alex, all the best. I hope um, that we can still work together on this device issue. Fantastic. I love to hear collaborations coming up. There's another question. I think this had been addressed, but I'll just read it out anyway. Um, can the speakers discuss their thoughts around device access more broadly, particularly in places and for those where incomes may only allow one or two individuals in a community to have access to any kind of phone, let alone a smartphone? Uh, the last question was from uh, Gordon Day. What national policies and international agreements are needed to accelerate digital access in Africa? I think that has also been addressed. Now, I'll just do a round robin, you know, from all the speakers and, and you know, uh, Vincent, you can come in last, but, you know, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts towards what the future looks like um, post COVID? Uh, 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 some people say we are already in post COVID, but, but what is your thought? Where do you think we are, we are headed towards. I'll probably start with uh, Alex. Hmm. Okay, I was hoping you weren't going to go to me first. Um, I think, I mean, I always, and I defer to my colleagues in Africa, because I have the luxury of living in Switzerland, and, you know, I grew up in Canada. So I, I, I'm going to presume on a very sort of, you know, narrow focus that, I mean, we're entering this new world where connectivity has to be, um, you know, it's part of how we will conduct our work, how we will learn, how we will uh, access health services. And I, I hope what is gonna come out of this is that the recognition that this is also where we need this in every country around the world and that this is no longer an option and that there is really a call to action that we really get this done. I mean, we use the number 428 billion because the ICU did some work with Alliance for Affordable Internet where this number came up. I know other reports, say that the, the cost of universal connectivity will range up to two and a half trillion. I think McKinsey and BCG have done work on that area, the World Bank. It's somewhere in there. It's actually not that much money, whether it's 400 billion or 200, two and a half trillion. So I, I really want and hope that the public sector, the international community can come together, not just say the private sector has got to figure it out, that we really figure out how to do this because in the end, it's not a huge number. And hopefully the world comes out of this realizing that every single uh, person needs the connectivity. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Over to you, Josephine. Thank you. And um, I think for me is um, us to realize that uh, I think individuals and communities are ready for connectivity. And I'll just uh, speak this out of my experience. Um, I remember around uh, 2018, uh, working with uh, schools in Kibera uh, through, of course, Tunapandanet, the community network. And it was quite a hassle to get buy-in just from teachers uh, because they were like, we already have a lot of work to do. Learning digital platforms is not what, and digitizing this content is not what we would like to add to our plate. But uh, now uh, COVID happened and it's actually now the schools approaching uh, the network to request for these classes for teachers and also looking into platforms uh, that will enable deliver um, platforms and as well as devices uh, that will be able to that will enable them to deliver remote learning. So I think for me the key thing is um, in the post uh, COVID world which we are living in, I think people are ready uh, to be connected and to come in and not just as consumers, but also creators. And so it's important for us to reduce uh, barriers to entry for people, uh, to build uh, individual and communities understanding that uh, they are also able to uh, shape uh, not just the interactions with the technology, but also the technology itself. And so, apart from just policies and devices, there's also the aspect around mindset, mindsets uh, for different individuals and communities that uh, we need to focus on. So uh, trying our best to build their confidence and uh, a baseline understanding of technology and how to use it uh, so that as they get to the digital spaces that, as well, uh, they come in as empowered users and creators. Thanks, Josephine, really appreciate it. Juanita, please. 
Thanks, Ronald. I think um, for me, um, you know, sort of closing words would be that I think the train is leaving the station and we've got to get on it. So, you know, we have to move the needle. We have to make sure that we do everything in our power to connect our communities. We have to st strictly start focusing on the digital divide, um, you know, so that we don't further marginalize communities by leaving them out of, you know, leaving them out of this. Um, the COVID pandemic has just thrown all of us into, um, you know, this fourth industrial revolution that, you know, everybody's starting. Um, and I think that we have to, as government, I still feel like there's not enough focus, you know, it's almost like it remains the quiet engine of the economy. There's not enough focus on having um, executionable broadband strategies across African governments. Um, and, um, you know, I think a lot needs to be done. The pandemic has come to really wake all of us up. It gave us a big shook. Um, and I think, you know, that now is the time that we have to um, adopt policies, create enabling environments, remove barriers to entries, um, make it easier for um, companies to deploy infrastructure, find um, workable PPPs um, and, uh, you know, work on, on uh, just how, how we can facilitate this. Um, today, we didn't even have a, a chance to, to touch on, you know, the future of work and what that looks like and work from home and demand. And I mean, this is such a mammoth um, uh, conversation. Uh, digital economy touches on every um, sector out there. It's going to disrupt every sector. And, um, you know, as the as, as sort of the, the people behind the, the digital economy, you know, the, the people that are bringing the, the digital economy to Africa, we've also got a responsibility to talk to all the sectors that are going to be impacted. One of the big conversations that we still have to have um, is that, you know, the, there's probably going to be mass job losses before there's going to be mass adoption of new jobs. Um, how do we reskill? How do we get our people ready to capitalize on this, this digital economy? Um, you know, while automation comes in and, and takes away from us. So um, still a lot of conversations ahead. And um, I really hope that, um, you know, there's a similar future conversations that we can have to keep talking about these important aspects. Thanks a lot for that perspective. Um, uh, Purva, and then Vincent will take us home. Thank you, Ronald. So uh, I, I would echo all the sentiments that were expressed by the previous speakers, but I would just leave on a, on a positive note that I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that the things are going to get better. And again, I'll, I'll say this from the perspective from a person living in the US. So we have seen that the, 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 the connectivity has changed the people's lives in a, in a, in a very profound way, like talking about working remotely, talking about telehealth, talking about telemedicine, talking about uh, virtual uh, schools. Uh, they're talking about uh, offline uh, education. All those things are possible only through connectivity. And we are seeing that that, that, that push is now being made from the consumer side to the, uh, to the governmental and the private partnerships. Uh, and they are, they are very much seeing it, that this is what the consumers are seeing. So maybe it will take some time, but I, will, I'll, I, I, see, I see that maybe in the next few years that the world is going to move towards a trend where, in, where in connectivity will be considered like a true fourth utility. Just like people talk about electricity, water, water, the connectivity is going to be a very important requirement for, 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 for every person on this planet. Thanks, Purva. Over to you, Vincent. Uh, th thank you so much, Ronald. And, and, and just like Purva, I, I, I'd like to uh, echo uh, the sentiments of all, of all our panelists today. And really, perhaps uh, speaking from Kampala, Uganda, where I've been uh, firmly grounded for the last 18 months, uh, I, I, I think in, in, a, in a very strange way, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been the single best thing that has happened to the movement that has been fighting and, and, and shouting about this digital divide. It has created a situation and elevated uh, it to a level that we have been struggling to attain for such a long time. We have the attention of so many people that we have been trying to get to the table to address this. And uh, the last six months have been uh, part of some conversations that uh, have probably taken me about five years to try and get to. Uh, I've, I've been called into discussions with the government of Uganda to talk about 
the, 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 uh, the possibility of perhaps assembling low cost devices in the country. Uh, the, 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 uh, the possibility of setting up some kind of uh, connectivity facility to link up all the schools in the country. Uh, we now have the attention of the people that we need to actually get the policies in place. So now it is upon us uh, all that have been, uh, uh, should I say, uh, driving this, beating the drums to articulate it to the folks that we need to really get this moving. We have their attention, we have their goodwill, and I think we'll be able to achieve quite a lot. Uh, uh, I can't say post COVID because I really don't know when that's gonna happen, but starting now, I think we are, we're in a really good place to get some really good work done. Thank you so much. And back to you, Ronald. Thanks, thanks a lot, Vincent. Thank you, all your speakers. It's been fantastic. And um, I'll hand back over to Iana to uh, wrap it up for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronald. Thank you to our incredible panel. This conversation has been so rich and so meaningful. I, I've been nodding vigorously and just really excited about the alignment I'm hearing throughout. Um, it's, it's also been incredible to get some really timely announcements. Um, thank you, Alex, for sharing uh, the a report that's uh, hot off the press and, of course, uh, some of the insights regarding the working group on affordable devices and more. I do hope this sparks some really great collaborations moving forward. I know that we had folks joining us um, from the Africa Council community uh, with a uh, number of folks connected under under one profile. So it's it's great that this conversation is going to be reaching those who are doing the work on the ground. Um, we are recording this. There will be a, a distribution of, of this recording broadly. Uh, again, if we didn't get to your questions, apologies, please feel free to email us uh, to uh, the email address you see on the screen. I also do want to invite everyone here warmly to join us for our event on December the 2nd. And with that, um, I know we are a bit over time and I thank you for staying with us, but I want to wish all of you a good morning, good evening and good afternoon. Thank you again. And I hope to see you on our next event. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.